Hi everyone, um, my name is Caroline and I'm a sophomore here at Short Ridge. Our guest today is Dr. Woody Myers, a physician and political figure from Indianapolis. Dr. Myers graduated from Short Ridge at the age of 16. Um, he went on to receive his BS and MBA from Stanford University, graduating from Stanford at 19. Dr. Myers obtained his medical degree from Harvard Medical School at the age of 23. At 30, Dr. Myers became uh, the Indiana State Health Commissioner. This was at the time uh, when the nation was just beginning to face up to a new disease, HIV AIDS. <clears throat> uh, when an Indiana teenager named Ryan White contracted the disease, Dr. Myers fought to keep Ryan in school when his district banned him after his diagnosis. Dr. Myers has also worked as the chief health officer uh, in big companies such as Ford and WellPoint. Recently, Dr. Myers was the Democratic nominee for Indiana governor. Welcome, Dr. Myers. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, um, so let's just start off talking about your time at Shore Ridge. Um, you graduated in 1970 at the age of 16. Um, so if you first could just tell us a little bit about what Short Ridge was like at the time um, in terms of size and of the student body and overall just the atmosphere. And then if you wouldn't mind just telling us how you were able to graduate at 16. Well, I, I, I remember my sh time at Short Ridge with a, 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 a lot of positive feelings. You know, high school can be rough. Uh, but uh, for me, actually, it, it was enjoyable. I was a little younger than all the other students, so I, I think my biggest issue was kind of I, I was a social misfit uh, in the sense that uh, I, I wasn't uh, a, a sort of the, the, at the same level of, of, uh, of, of sort of uh, ac uh, uh, adolescent maturity, perhaps. Let me just use those words that, uh, as some of the other students. Uh, so I didn't go on very many dates. Uh, I, I, I didn't do a lot of the cool stuff. I, you know, I, I got invited to maybe two parties the entire time I was there, but I didn't let that bother me. I, 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 uh, I enjoyed being in, in, uh, in high school. I had a lot of great friends, uh, and I remember several of my teachers very well. Um, uh, uh, I remember my history class, uh, my, uh, my biology class, uh, my government class. Uh, I remember working on the Short Ridge Echo. I don't know if they still have the Echo or not, but but I wrote an article uh, uh, at the time that the uh, assistant principal didn't like, uh, and he wanted me to change it. And I said, no, I wasn't going to change it. So I, got, I think I got kicked off of the Echo staff for being somewhat defiant, but it, I thought it was my First Amendment right. Uh, to say what I wanted to say, so uh, I, 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 I remember that. Uh, I, I, uh, I only played sports for one year. I wasn't really that good at football, even though I was a big guy. Uh, so I, I only played football for for, uh, for, for a year. Uh, but I, I had pretty good I had pretty good fun uh, in, in high school and and uh, I remember uh, one last thing I'll say about it. Uh, uh, in 1968, Short Ridge High School went to the state basketball finals. Uh, and we played Gary Roosevelt. It was at Hinkle Fieldhouse. In those, those days, they called it Butler Fieldhouse. And uh, I remember that we, I, we had already planned the victory party for after the, the state, because we had a really great team that year. Uh, but Gary Roosevelt had other ideas. Uh, and so we lost that game 68 to 60. I remember the score. It was the saddest day of my little high school life. I was a, I was a sophomore at, at the time. And uh, it was like all our world just kind of deflated uh, after that game. Uh, one, one other little memory too, the, in April, on April 4th, 1968, uh, that's when uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I was in, in Short Ridge at the time. And, and uh, it was a really tough day for the city of Indianapolis. Uh, Robert Kennedy, was in Indianapolis uh, that day, that night, and calmed everybody down. I, I, I was watching TV and saw his speech live uh, when it happened. Of course, they interrupted all the TV shows to show what was going on. And unlike a lot of other cities, Indianapolis did not have a big riot like they did in other places. And a lot of people give, uh, give uh, uh, Kennedy credit for calming things down in our city. Uh, Short Ridge was pretty, it was pretty rough being in school the next day. A lot of folks were upset and angry. Uh, I remember that we, we did a little march around the school. We didn't quite know how to do a protest march. <laughs> there were no guidebooks. So what do you do uh, after you've walked around the school and, and, and chanted a few times? Uh, 
and then we went back to school. I guess that that was the that was that's that's what we did. And, but there was no violence or anything like that. Uh, but it was a very rough a, a rough time for America, a rough time for Indianapolis and Indiana, uh, and a rough time uh, in as as a high school student. It made us think about race and all the issues surrounding race. Uh, and we had discussions about it in some of our classes. Uh, but I remember Shortridge uh, with a very, very positive, uh, a very positive feeling. That's that's great to hear. It's really interesting because I know in some of my classes, like we still have those discussions regularly. So it's nice to hear some of the parallel for that. Um, so you grew up in Indianapolis and then graduated from Shortridge. So what made you choose Stanford University for college? Well, I wanted to get as far away from Indianapolis as I could. <laughs> and I wanted to go to as good a school as I could get into. Uh, so I, I applied to schools on the West Coast and the East Coast. Uh, I had really never heard of Stanford, uh, nor had the counselors. The, the college counselors uh, at, 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 in those days were just not all that great. And when I told him I was thinking about my, my guy, I told him I was thinking about going to Stanford. He, he said Stanford, Connecticut. He didn't he didn't know Stanford was like a university in California. He was thinking it was a city in Connecticut, Stamford instead of Stanford. You know, uh, and I said, no, guy, there's a university out there that's actually pretty good. Uh, and uh, I, I applied. I got in. Uh, you know, I don't I don't to this day know why they took me, but uh, they did. Uh, and uh, I loved it. I'm, I am so glad I did that. My dad did not want me to go. Uh, my, my dad wanted me to go to the University of Chicago, uh, and I went up to visit University of Chicago, uh, and I remember uh, they, they, they put me in this gray, dark dormitory. It was a Friday night, and people were sitting outside their rooms talking about physics uh, on a Friday night, and I this isn't college this is you're not supposed to do that in college they did take us to a blues concert i gotta hand it to them we uh i saw buddy guy who is an incredible blues guitarist uh, they took us to a concert of his uh but uh, i decided you know what i think i'll, I'll go to california instead so i, I accepted the uh, stanford offer and got on an airplane and it would cost 70 bucks seven zero dollars which is you know pretty cheap uh, we, I got on a flight. We went on a TWA plane. I got on a TWA plane to to, uh, to St. Louis, changed planes, got off in San Francisco, got on the bus. Uh, they had buses to take the kids down to Stanford. Uh, uh, and I was sitting in the back of the bus, and everybody on the bus seemed like they knew somebody. I didn't know anybody. And I just sat there the whole time asking myself, what did I do? Why did I do? You know, well, here I am way out in the middle of California. And then and then the bus made a turn into the campus. Stanford campus is incredibly beautiful, incredibly beautiful. And I, re I remember the first time I saw uh, the Stanford church going down Palm Drive and, and I knew immediately that I had made the right decision. Uh, and I've never looked back, I've never regretted it once. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting to hear. Um, so just uh, at what point did you know that you wanted to be a physician? That's a fairly, uh, big goal, but I would like to hear about that, yeah. Well, uh, it actually goes back to Shortridge. I didn't always want to be a physician. I was in my history class. Uh, my class was taught by a guy named Tom Henderson. Uh, and one of the guys next to me, one of my, my, the students in the class was a guy named Tom Nolan, who's now actually uh, uh, a high school leader in, in Southern California. And at, at the time, the Vietnam War was raging. And uh, my dad had been in the Army and had been a sergeant. He was in the Army Air Corps and had been a sergeant. And I decided, well, you know, because every guy kind of wants to outdo his dad, at least in the, those days. And so, if, well, if he's in the Army, I'm going to be in the Marine Corps. And if he's a sergeant, I'm going to be a captain. Uh, and I really thought that I should go to Vietnam uh, and uh, and and to uh, to be in the Marines, but I couldn't. I was way too unhealthy to pass the physical uh, exam. Uh, and I, I remember talking about it to that guy, Tom Nolan, in, in the class. And I told him I was going to go to Vietnam. And he said, man, why do you want to do that? You have to kill people in war. And I, he started talking. About it. And I said, you know, my little 14-year-old brain uh, said, well, gosh, he's right. I don't want to kill people. I want to save them. <laughs> and so I did a 180. Uh, and I said, I know what I'll do. I'll save lives instead of taking, I'm literally, that was how my little 14 year old brain or 15 year old brain worked in those days. Uh, 
Uh, and that's the beginning of me becoming pre-med. I was, uh, Mr. Black was my biology teacher at Stanford, excuse me, at, at uh, Short Ridge. And uh, he said, uh, I, I got a really good grade in his class. Uh, and he said, I ought to think about doing something like medicine. And I said, wow, my biology teacher thinks I can do it. And, and those kind of encouraging statements kind of got me going. Uh, so I look back on Short Ridge as having been a major influence in me becoming a pre-med student at Stanford. Well, yeah, that's really great to hear. I, I like like hearing how you switch so quickly. Um, well, talking about Shore Ridge and physicians, so I know that there are a lot of students here at Shore Ridge, um, myself included, that are aspiring physicians. So Good. what advice would you give to those students? Uh, keep your eye, keep your eyes on the ball. Uh, you know, the the uh, there are a lot of distractions when you're 15, 16, 17 and 18. Uh, and, and that'll keep you from uh, from pursuing your goals if you let them. I know that it's a time when a lot of kids begin experimenting with tobacco and alcohol and drugs. And I, I guarantee you, if you want to take care of, of if you want to become a physician, uh, that those kind of experiments can cost you uh, time and, and, and cost your reputation. Uh, and then it'll be hard for you to, to fulfill your goals. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's going to be it's going to be challenging. It's you know the the, uh, the, uh, the 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 qualifications to become a doctor are pretty rigorous, and that's a good thing. You, you don't want the people who are the, at the bottom of the class to become the doctors. Uh, you want the people who are truly truly dedicated, uh, truly truly uh, interested in helping people, and who are brilliantly capable in terms of their academic ability. You don't have to be a, a you don't have to be like an a, a plus math student and an A plus science student and an A plus English student and on and on, but you got to be pretty good. Uh, and, and you got to be pretty good overall. And yet and more importantly, you got to be a good human being. Uh, because to be a good doctor, the number one requirement is to be a good good human being first and understand that your job is to help the patient. Your job is to protect human life. Uh, your your job is to find new cures for for old diseases, and uh, and your job is to teach others to how to do what you're doing. Uh, and, but it's a wonderful career. I mean, you can become a doctor, and then take your skills anywhere in the world. If, I mean, even with language barriers. I mean, I, I am a I am the chairman of the board of an organization called the 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 Mozambique Healthcare uh, Consortium. Uh, and so we do projects in Mozambique. In fact, I was on a Zoom uh, this morning uh, with one of my uh, colleagues uh, out in, in, in Maputo, Mozambique, uh, uh, who, uh, who was very involved in, in helping the local folks to, uh, uh, to thrive in businesses. And I was getting an update on what was going on in Mozambique. I hope to go back uh, sometime later this year. Uh, it, it, and, and being a physician, you're, you can do that kind of stuff. You can get involved anywhere in the world uh, uh, with issues that are very important, like healthcare. We talked a lot about what's going on in COVID, with COVID in Mozambique, and the and testing, and the vaccine, and hospitalizations. And in fact, we had an hour Zoom scheduled. We didn't get through our agenda at all, so we got to do another one, like later on this week or next week. But I, I, I tell you what, if I was not a doctor, if I didn't have the interest that I have in science and in healthcare, I don't think I could have done any of the, many of the things that I've ended up doing over the last 40, 50 years. And so becoming a physician just opens up all kinds of wonderful doors to young people to be able to really help others. Uh, and, uh, and, and, that's, and, and that's a really cool thing to do. Yeah, that's really, uh, really inspiring to hear. Thank you for that. Um, just real quick, I'd like to quickly remind everyone that we will soon be taking questions from the chat, so don't forget to send out any questions that you have. Um, so, Dr. Myers, in the 1980s, much of your time was consumed by the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, could you just speak in some detail about your work during this time and maybe just give a brief um, background about what was actually going on? I, I did my... Uh... Uh, residency, internal medicine residency. That's when you like after you graduate, you do you do kind of uh, apprenticeship uh, at Stanford Hospital, uh, and then I joined the faculty at University of California, San Francisco. Excuse me, at a place called San Francisco General Hospital, and that was the county hospital for San Francisco. 
And San Francisco was what we called an epicenter of the HIV uh, AIDS uh, crisis. And we were seeing a lot of kids, I say kids, these are primarily young men, primarily gay men, primarily in the age group of like 18 to 28, uh, coming into the emergency room and in the clinic with these very unusual pneumonias and skin lesions. And we were really asking ourselves, gee, what's going on? Why are we seeing all this? And of course that led to the discovery of what we used to call HTLV-3, and then we changed the name of it to the Human uh, Immunodeficiency Virus, or HIV. And, 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 and that was a, a very challenging time because there were so many people who had negative attitudes towards people who were gay. Uh, there were so many people who had negative attitudes towards people who used or were addicted to drugs, especially intravenous drugs. And the HIV virus is primarily transmitted through uh, intercourse and through drug use, uh, similar to how hepatitis is transmitted. Uh, and so people got all discombobulated is the word that I give, it's kind of an old word, uh, but angry, confused, upset, uh, and, they, and they blamed the person's uh, lifestyle, they blamed the person's medical problem uh, on the, and they said, that's why we're having this epidemic. And, and that's what made people really kind of uh, uh, crazy, and, and, and you know the kind of folks that you saw uh, 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 mobbing the Capitol building uh, this past week. There were there were similar folks uh, involved in opposing uh, uh, e efforts to uh, deal with the HIV epidemic when I was health commissioner. Uh, one of the biggest cases that we had was a, a high school uh, kid. His name was Ryan White, uh, and he was in the he was a middle school guy. Uh, and, and, and the Western Middle School in Kokomo, and people in Kokomo, Indiana, found out that he was HIV positive, and their parents said, we want him kicked out of school. And even though we told them, the, the, well, you know, he's not going to spread it. You know, he's not in the bathroom doing things that are going to cause people to get this disease. He's not going to, if he breathes on you, that's not how this virus is transmitted and on and on, but they didn't want to believe us. They got very angry, very upset with me and with a lot of other folks because we wanted him to go to school. Uh, and in those days, it was the local health officer, not the state health officer, who made the final decision. So we ultimately got the law changed. But while we were getting the law changed, I spoke up and said, look, there's no reason for us not to let Ryan in school. And I, I did a press conference with him and his mom. Uh, we, 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 I touched him. I, I scruffed his head to show that, that, you know, if I'm the senior doctor in the state of Indiana and I'm willing to touch it, a, somebody who has HIV, then that means I'm not scared, right? And so those are the kinds of things that we did. Uh, he he, he um, uh, ultimately transferred out of Kokomo uh, to uh, uh, Hamilton Heights uh, uh, School, a high school up in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Hamilton County. Uh, and I remember that we had all summer to get them all ready for it. And we had a terrific HIV AIDS team at the State Board of Health. They spent all summer uh, educating the parents, educating the school, the, the doing community meetings and so on. And so the first day of school, uh, when, when Ryan was starting high school, man, that every news truck in America was up at the Hamilton Heights School. We didn't know what was going to happen. We really did not know whether or not they were going to riot or something else was going to go. And, and you know what happened? The president of the student council, a, a, a woman who's actually now a physician, uh, ran out of the school and hugged him. Uh, and welcomed him, and the teachers came out and welcomed him. Uh, it was a, it was a very beautiful sight because it showed that with education, people can change their minds. Uh, in Indiana, which was thought of as a sort of a backwards, you know, regressive state with respect to AIDS, all, all of a sudden it was like a 180, a flip. Uh, we were looked at as a as a, a state who could uh, welcome uh, a kid who was uh, suffering with this virus. Uh, and uh, it really changed the, the feeling about uh, AIDS. And because of all of the publicity, Ryan became an international celebrity. I mean, Michael Jackson bought him a car and took him to concerts and Elton John, and he got invited to the White House and all kinds of stuff started happening. Unfortunately, uh, he was born a couple years too early for the, uh, for the, uh, the treatment for HIV AIDS that now has turned it from a lethal disease into a chronic disease. Uh, and so he died in a, in a, few, a few years later, uh, but uh, he played a very important role, and I and our uh, health department played a role in, in helping people to understand uh, what was going on uh, with this virus and, and why we should 
fight the virus, not the people with the virus. And that was the important distinction that we had to make uh, when uh, when uh, uh, we uh, when we were dealing with the HIV AIDS uh, when I was health commissioner a long time ago. Yeah, that's great to hear. It's definitely, um, you know, even still seen as such a controversial thing. So it's it's great to hear about your work during that time. Um, so you've been a candidate for Congress and for governor. Um, so why did you want to enter politics and how did your experience as a medical doctor um, shape your role in politics? So those are two similar things, but also very different at the same time. Wow, you, these are great questions. Are I, I suspect one day you might become a journalist or something. I don't know. It's a, <laughs> as a, and a physician, you could do both, by the way. Uh, I I, uh, I wanted to to do everything I could to help as many as I could for as long as I could, uh, and uh, I thought that by uh, getting involved in changing some of the laws, uh, that we could get more care to more people. Uh, when when you're a doctor, you do great things by taking care of one patient at a time, and and that's a wonderful thing to do. And then when I ran an ICU, I well I had like eight to twenty patients depending on how full we were at a time, and so you know we, we would take care of that unit, but you know, I said, you look, I, 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 I wanted to bite off a bigger chunk uh, of, of people to do more for and, 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 to, and to help. And so that's when I became health commissioner. And when I was Indiana State Health Commissioner, I had 5.5 million patients in the sense because that was the number of people in Indiana when I was health commissioner. And then when I said, well, if I run for Congress, then I'll have, I can affect the entire United States and some other countries. And and, and so that's kind of what inspired me to, to, to do what I could to figure out ways to, to bring good health care, good jobs, and good education. Here's the, here's the thing that I realized as a doctor. The people that got the best medical care were the people who had the best medical insurance and therefore money to get it. And that's the way our system works, unfortunately. I've been working to change it, as have others, but that's the way the system works today. The people that got the best jobs in health insurance are the people who have the best education. Uh, and so logically, if you want people to get great healthcare outcomes, they need great jobs, great insurance, and a great education to be able to do it. And so I thought, well, what we've got to really do is improve our educational system to make sure that, that everybody has an equal opportunity, that as many people that uh, we possibly can get into college and into trade schools and into good careers, that's the way to change the world. Uh, to change the economic system and, and, and so that it treats people fairly. Uh, and there's a lot of things you can do on the side. You can improve research. Uh, you can make things better for people that are incarcerated. Uh, you know, one of the things I like to talk about, we need to put the correct back into corrections. In other words, when people are incarcerated, the day they get in is the day that you work with them to make sure that they understand how to not come back uh, and give them a skill and give them the understanding and change their there are a lot of people have mental health issues, drug related issues, because that, and that's what it causes them to commit crimes. And those are the things that I learned as a physician and I wanted to try to fix. And I thought, well, let me run for Congress. And uh, when I ran for Congress, I came in second of eight people in the primary. Uh, but you got to come in first in order to keep going. I said, OK, well, the political bug is out of my system now and I, I, I can go back and do other things. And, but I was wrong uh, when the opportunity came up to think about running for governor. Uh, I really wanted to support someone uh, uh, who I thought would be a, a great candidate who could do a great job, but nobody was emerging. And I said, well, heck, if nobody else is gonna do it, I, maybe I should throw my hat in the ring. All of those things were though before uh, COVID hit. Uh, and COVID made, made a, had a major impact, of course, on every uh, political race in the country in so many different ways. All that's to say is that, that, that I have always thought that, that becoming involved in politics was a great way for me to continue my work as a physician uh, and to continue to work on the problems that cause people to, uh, to, to need help. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the people that are listening, the, the kids at Short Ridge that are listening and, 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 and that they're thinking about medicine, I want them to think about something, uh, that, uh, a little story that I'm about to tell. If, if, if you're, let's say it's your grandmother, walks across the street, let's pick a street, Keystone, Meridian, 38th Street. If she walks across the street and halfway across the street, she has a, 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 a stroke or a heart attack and falls down in the middle of the street, then someone will call 911 
an ambulance will be there usually within five minutes. We'll pick her up without any questions about how much money she has or I mean, you know, whatever else, and take her to the nearest hospital where they will figure out whether she had a heart attack or a stroke, and they'll do something about it. And that's the, the emergency care system that we have in the United States. And compared to a lot of other countries, it's pretty good. But if your same grandmother walks across the street with bad blood pressure, and, and if she had that blood pressure treated, which will cost less than a couple bucks a day, then she would never get the heart attack or the stroke that we would gladly pick her up and take care of. The heart attack or stroke is many, many thousands and thousands of dollars. But getting the blood pressure diagnosed and treated is really inexpensive. So why wouldn't we want to get everybody's blood pressure diagnosed and treated so that we don't have as many heart attacks and strokes? And, and that's why I got involved in politics, because it just makes so much sense to me that that's what we ought to do. Uh, but it's hard. It's hard to change the system. It's hard to change a system where so many vested interests are, are wanting the system to stay the way it is because they're doing very well economically with the way the system is today. So I would encourage all the great kids at Shortridge, kids, excuse me, young scholars at Shortridge High School who want to change the world, you stick with it. You don't, don't listen to old people that tell you you can't do it or you shouldn't do it. You know, you stick with your guns and you get in there in college and you do the best job you can. You become a physician and you figure out your way of saving the world. It doesn't have to be by running for office. It could be become you could become a cancer researcher, a cardiologist, a family practitioner, an OBGYN. Think about all the, 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 the babies that are going to be born over the next, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Somebody's got to bring them into the world right, correctly so that the moms and the babies do well. That is a great job to have. Can you, I mean, can you imagine uh, the, 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 the experiences that you'll have in doing that and the lives that you can save by doing it right? Oh, there's just so much that's happening in medicine today that I just would be very excited for as many of the young people at Short Ridge as possible to think about medicine as a career. We need you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy now, and so I'm gonna need one of you guys to go to the, become a great doctor so that when I get to the point where I'm having those problems, uh, that one of you can take good care of me. Uh, and, 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 and then on and on and on and on and on. So that, that's the way the system should work. And uh, if, if you're interested in healthcare, you're interested in medicine, now is your time. Whether you wanna be a nurse, a doctor, a pharmacist, anything. COVID-19 has exposed all of the problems that we have in the healthcare system in the world today that haven't been fixed. Why? Because my generation hasn't been smart enough to fix them. We've made some progress, but nowhere near enough. What does that mean? That means that your generation of young people has to take over and do the job that my generation has failed to do. And I want to help you to do that. So please, please, please. Follow your dreams and make sure that you're doing something that's going to save us from ourselves. Thank you for that. That was that was very, very interesting to hear. Um, well, sort of leading into that, I guess, um, you know, talking about the pandemic, we're almost a year into it. Um, and as a doctor, just uh, what's your role been in response to the pandemic? pandemic has been mismanaged here in the state of Indiana and nationwide. There are lots and lots of things that they could have done better. Well, the good news is that we have a vaccine and that's starting to get this, this the, to, to be used. We've got to do a much better job of distributing the vaccine. That's the next big step. And that's what I think Indiana and the world has to work on right now. All right, thank you for that. Well, um, we are at time now, but thank you so much for joining us today. It was really great to talk with you and hear everything that you have to say. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, this concludes our World Changing 101. Um, thank you, Dr. Myers, and thank you students and staff for attending today. Appreciate you guys, keep working on it. Thank you, yeah. All right.